All right, good evening. Welcome Inside Out family and friends to our Composer Spotlight concert tonight. I'm CJ Mingi, director of Inside Out Steel Band. Uh, most of you all, I think we know each other, but if you're new to Inside Out Steel Band, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit in Austin, Texas. And uh, we've been around for about 20 years, uh, been a federal nonprofit since 2013. And our mission is very simple. It's to build community through music. And this is another way that we get to um, share music with our friends and introduce you to new things that you can do with steel pan and new composers and performers and all of that. So once again, thanks so much for being here. Um, this has been a really fun series to start to put together that's really been spearheaded by Lewis Raymond Kolker. This is our third installment of the um, the concert series, and tonight we get to feature the music of Alexis Lamb, who's joining us from Connecticut. Um, just quick background about Alexis. She um, is an excellent percussionist and composer, performer, educator. She does all things related to uh, music, education, performance, and outreach. And uh, she just recently completed her master's degree in music composition from Yale. Congratulations on that, Alexis and also has degrees from Northern Illinois University. Um, and just a quick note for our friends that are joining us on Zoom tonight, we are live streaming to YouTube that will archive. And as much as we love seeing your smiling faces, if you wouldn't mind having your video turned off, I'm sorry, Virginia, we'll make it up to you, I promise. Um, that way, when we archive it, we'll have the faces of the composer and the performer. So uh, that's my quick little spiel at the beginning. We have three pieces on the concert tonight. Alexis will talk about each of the pieces just prior to the performance. And then remember to please stick around for the Q&A afterwards. Um, you can put comments or questions in the chat on Zoom. Uh, we also are streaming to YouTube tonight. So welcome if you're joining us from YouTube. Feel free to use the chat for comments and questions there. And we'll keep our eye on both of those places. So once again, please help me to welcome Alexis C. Lamb to our concert. Welcome, Alexis. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really delighted to be here and contribute to the community building that Inside Out is doing. That's, that's a really important part of the music making process for me. So I'm always happy to be a part of it. Uh, so the first piece that we're gonna have for you is actually a, a fairly new piece. It was written um, in the spring of this past year, just prior to COVID-19 hitting the United States. And it was composed for my dear friend, Louis Raymond Kolker. Um, he was asking for a piece that would you know just embody the uh virtuosity of the steel pans in a solo form and i really uh was inspired by the recent pieces that i had seen and and the pieces over the past couple of years that i had seen from liam teague in particular where he was combining different sets of pans so this combines the double second steel pans with the tenor pan um, it's entitled internal dialogue which i will uh Without sharing too much, I will let each of you decide what your internal dialogue is with this, regards to this piece. But what I was exploring technically uh, was the symmetry between two different chords that exist within our 12-note um, Western system, which is the augmented triad, which is a, a symmetrical major triad plus major triad, and then the diminished seventh chord, which is a symmetrical minor seven plus my or excuse me minor third plus minor third plus minor third plus minor third and so these two chords are the most symmetrical that exist within our our western um tonal system and so i was playing around with what happens when you actually splice the two of them together what happens when you have one note in common and then you get this augmentation here and then this diminished material here and how can those play forward and and what sort of pitch collections can we um can we create so thank you so much to inside out for having me tonight thank you to lewis for what I'm sure will be an excellent performance and I'll turn it over to you.
And that wasn't even canned applause. I'm so happy for that. Thank you, Lewis. That was wonderful. Um, so the next piece that we're going to hear on the concert is actually part of a new project that I'm really excited about. Uh, it's a solo project that is combining um, three of my favorite ways of, of conveying art. Um, one of them is with the spoken word, particularly with poets uh, like Andrea Gibson, who's a really big influence of mine and uh, with my background in percussion and uh, using electronics to combine these two and create other outside elements that um, really bring everything together. So this is the second piece of this solo project that I'm doing that I'm calling the Concord of Discord. And this piece is entitled Smoke Screen. Um, you know, we are all going through so many things in the world right now and there's so much uh, uncertainty and destruction and concern for others and concern for ourselves that's going on and I think that this piece is really um, for me it's a call to authenticity and it's really a hope that in the world um, moving forward when we come back together that we can all um, come together with a sense of authenticity and with a sense of genuine want to to gather together and to be our true selves. So I hope that you enjoy this next piece. It's entitled Smoke Screen for the solo project, The Concord of Discord.
times have we shared stories with others while surrounding ourselves in smoke screens? A sleight of hand, a chiffon fabric folded over and over again, hoping people can't see through the layers. Smoke screening, filtering, concealing. But just like the makeup, it doesn't conceal all our blemishes completely. A mask. A facade. Sheltering the self. But from what? It's interesting how a smoke screen can turn this binary into a spectrum, transforming every concrete statement into a question, and you find yourself reading through the conversations like detectives searching for evidence in a 30-year-old cold case. All right, thanks for tuning in and listening to that piece. Um, the last piece that's gonna be on our program tonight is one that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was, I, I did my undergraduate work at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. And it's actually one of the universities that had um, one of the first steel pan programs in the country. And I believe is still the only uh, um, university in the United States where you can receive a master's degree in steel pan performance. And I was really, really lucky to be able to study with um, both Liam Teague and the late Dr. Clifford Alexis, um, who actually, Cliff was the uh, the gentleman who built the pans that I was playing on in that piece and that are sitting right behind me. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for those gorgeous instruments. Um, I think what I learned from them the most was just how 
incredibly versatile this instrument is in the same way that we think of the versatility or the virtuosity of a violin or um, any you know percussion instrument or a clarinet or what have you the steel pan is um, it can do all of that and more and I really appreciate and honor and respect everything that Liam and Cliff taught me um, I also want to take this moment to, as Liam always does at the end of concerts, thank the people of Trinidad and Tobago for giving us these beautiful instruments and so that we can enjoy and, and celebrate them and um, share them with our communities. Um, so this piece is entitled Spectrum. It was dedicated to Liam and Cliff. Um, and on this video, I'm so happy. It just makes me smile all over with um, all the performers that are on this this video dear friends of mine from University of Nebraska and beyond uh, so thank you again to Lewis for organizing the video performance of this and I hope you enjoy this new video premiere of Spectrum
Great. Thank you so much for letting me share these pieces with you tonight. And I am, again, really happy to be a part of the Inside Out Steel Band community. And um, yeah, thank you for all of the, the performers on the pieces as well. I'm, I'm so excited to see so many familiar faces. Wow. That was outstanding. Thank you, Alexis, for creating such wonderful music, um, like such depth in so many different directions. That last piece was really beautiful orchestration and composition. Uh, Smokescreen is a very powerful, impactful piece. Um, like you have so much to offer and thank you for sharing it with us tonight. Um, Lewis, congrats on the performance. Wonderful job as always. Those of you who are part of Inside Out know how amazing Lewis is and we're lucky to have him to be a part of the Inside Out family. So keep it up. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move into our Q&A now. Um, let me get this up. This should be the three of us. Um, and Zoom folks, thanks for being so compliant and keeping your video off so we can grab the archive of us uh, for this conversation here. So uh, you are more than welcome to put uh, comments and especially questions into the Zoom chat if you're joining us on Zoom tonight. Likewise, on the YouTube, uh, we, Lewis and I both have both of those pulled up, and we would love to hear from you any questions you have, any comments, so that can steer our conversation in uh, whatever direction you're interested in. Um, so I'll just open with one question, and then I'll have Lewis and Alexis kind of cover most of it. Um, so um, I had said initially that I was going to ask Alexis about her entrance into steel band composition, but you did such a great job describing your um, path with NIU and of course, uh, Cliff Alexis, who is, uh, has done more than people realize, I think, you know, I think a small group of people realize how he gave his life to this art form, um, but it, it reaches far beyond um, what I think a lot of people imagine. Um, and of course, Liam Teague is such a great ambassador in person. Um, so my, my question that I'll ask to start with is for those pieces specifically, you know, as a trained percussionist, a very proficient pan player, how much are you writing at the instrument versus away from the instrument? Um, I especially enjoyed you describing compositionally what you did with the first piece. Um, how much time do you spend on the instrument, um, both in the composition process and then as you're workshopping something and making changes and edits? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think it changes from piece to piece, um, it, particularly with this, the solo project, the Concord of Discord. I am writing everything at the instruments. Um, so the other piece that I've written so far is one that incorporates vibraphone and electronics primarily. So wrote it completely there. And then the text, you know, kind of a side by side thing. Um, with internal dialogue, I was very aware of wanting to maintain the idiomatic quality of the piece because I know that it's already difficult enough as it is. And Lewis did an amazing job of performing it. Um, but again, I wanted to just really do my best to make sure that it was enjoyable to play as well as maybe enjoyable to listen to, <laughs> depending yeah. on who you ask. Um, for Spectrum, that was actually my first piece that I wrote for Steel Band. And at the time, I had a little bit of experience playing cello pan, but primarily at NIU, I played quad pans, um, quadraphonics. Mm -hmm. So I had, again, the symmetric... Um, you know, sets of diminished triads on each of the pans, which was a real fun time when it was a chromatic scale, but, uh, uh -huh. you know, triads and things like that weren't as, weren't as easy, I guess I should say. It was still mm -hmm. fun. Um, and so I was doing a lot of consulting. I was working a lot with the graduate students at that time. And when the piece came to life, I was actually working with Akua Leith, uh, who is mm -hmm. a conductor down in, in Trinidad again right now, but he was a, the grad student who initially conducted Spectrum at NIU. And so he and I were working closely together, not only on the conducting rehearsal processes, but also just what works well for the pan. And um, so I was really grateful to him and to Con Cordis was another gentleman who I worked with. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to their voices. But I think a lot of the work that I do is mostly at um, a piano or a keyboard yeah. of some sort. And then um, approaching it on the instruments and hoping that it works out. I have a, for anything that's other than steel pan, I have a, a little booklet of like fingering charts and things. And um, my background teaching band certainly helps with a lot of that. But my background with understanding steel pans has significantly helped in terms of thinking about um, what the most resonant ranges are on the instruments and you know what works best in terms of sticking patterns and um, just general clarity of the ideas that I want to get across. Nice. 
And then just very quickly, did you did you learn piano as your first instrument when you were a child or what did you learn first? I will never admit that I know piano. <laughs> I just use <laughs> okay. it. <laughs> okay. um, I, my first instrument was actually guitar when I was uh, yeah. five. And then yeah. I um, picked up bass my freshman year of high school. And then I picked up percussion my sophomore year of high school. And I was primarily a mallet percussionist. Um, so that's, I guess, the correlation to piano. But uh, aside from lessons in college on piano, I have... I will never play it professionally. It's not something that I. It, it's something for my own personal enjoyment. Yeah. And of course, as a as a you know pedagogical tool for me as a teacher, as well as a compositional tool for me when I want to just ch chalk things up a little bit. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's so valuable for that composing and arranging. Um, Lewis. Yeah, I, I did want to just like jump in on Spectrum. I have my score right here, and I've been spending a lot of time. This is really cool. This is like one of the first pieces that I really like learned for one of these concerts. Um, the pieces from Jonathan and the pieces from Ian were already in my repertoire um, and they were smaller pieces that I had excuses to play already. This one I specifically like put together for this concert because that was my chance to get a group together. Um, and I wanted to play it really since I heard it first um, at the Living Room Music booth at PASIC in 2018 and then Alexis gifted me the score, which was really nice of her um, when she was in Nebraska in March. But just like looking at the ranges that she uses within all the pans, like the tenor pan players are all over the map and especially like in the very, very high ranges, which is something that's so uncommon in steel band writing is like using those extreme high C sharp, high E's, which are the same ones um, that Alexis uses at the end of internal dialogue. And I just really love like getting to use the entire instrument um, and it's effective and she scores it so it works. So like, like you were saying about using the ranges of the instrument, like resonant ranges and having just such a good idiomatic sense of the instrument. Like I really appreciated that going into this piece and not just using the same like one octave that most steel band pieces use for tenor pan. Yeah, thank you for that. I um, again, I recognize that the higher register is is really for me, and especially in Spectrum, is really more of a color element. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of like when you have a a symphony piece and the upper violins are just in the stratosphere, but they're being reinforced with the exact same melody an octave or two down in the violas and cellos, and so that you get this extra um, resonance. It's almost as if you can. Um, can like voluntarily map out the harmonic series right in front of you. So you have that octave spread that's happening. And then from there you get the natural harmonic series that comes out of the instruments themselves. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful that it works for everybody. Yeah. Um, so we do have a question on the YouTube comments. Uh, this is from a friend of the program, Alex Richard. Um, and Alex asked, is the spoken word of smokescreen original from a specific text and or inspired by other poets? Yeah, it's original. Um, so all of the pieces for the Concord of Discord project are original texts, which is actually something else that I'm um, really wanting to explore more of. And I, I'm thinking of it again from the percussionist standpoint, particularly of rhythm and of allowing certain rhyme schemes when they do happen to not always occur at the end of a line, for example. So having a little bit of patterning that, that comes throughout the piece um, or throughout the different phrases and, and sections. Um, I would say my biggest influence is, is Andrea Gibson. They're a poet that's based in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm actually, as of yesterday, I signed up to take um, a writing course with them. They're offering an online writing course for the first time. So I'm really excited, hoping that that's going to be another um, another area that I can explore. Yeah. Um, kind of following up with this, I prefaced this question with you yesterday, but I have always been a fan of your using text um, in your compositions. I'm thinking of the yellow wallpaper for speaking and playing vibraphone. And then uh, the symphony orchestra piece that I'm blanking on the name of, but that you premiered in December. Um, will you talk about just like how you got into the speaking and playing vibe of writing? Because I feel like that's not especially common. Yeah, sure. The orchestra piece was called She Was There Too. 
Um, it's a, a piece that actually, it wasn't for speaking live at that time, but it was using audio samples or excerpts of interviews that I had gathered from um, women who had a pivotal role of being the first women of something at Yale, um, since this was the year of celebrating women at Yale, 50 years of women in the undergraduate program and 150 years in the graduate program. Um, which has a, that's, that's a different story for a different time that we can, I'm always happy to discuss. Um, in terms of the speaking things, I, you know, I actually am coming to terms with this a little bit myself as well and realizing that I really do love using my voice. Um, I don't think that I'm a singer. I can, I can sing, uh, not well to my standards. It's not something that I feel like I want to share as a color in a lot of my pieces. With that being said, I actually wrote a song last week that I was singing in and I wanted to hear my voice to sing it, which I was like, wow, this is so interesting. Um, but I do feel like I, especially being a percussionist, um, especially being a percussionist who's constantly reminding myself and learning to breathe while I play, um, the spoken word allows me to convey those thoughts and convey the text in a similar way as singing without losing my voice as the element of being able to perform it. And I feel like there's, I, I'm also just really fascinated with this um, genre of storytelling that, you know, there are so many art forms, especially within our music world that are passed down by rote and you know, in our Western world, we don't often see those come about with the exception of when we do study um, music from other parts of the world. But it's something that, you know, we all remember stories from our childhood of grandparents telling us something or our parents telling us something or a, another family member or, or there's some sort of rote learning that was happening where people were passing down things that they wanted you to remember. And the idea of anybody's voice being able to convey um, something that they want to tell you that's important to them, I think is a really powerful thing for me right now. And so it's something that I'm hoping to um, continue to pursue with this solo project, as well as hopefully with a um, any sort of formal dissertation work that I hope to be doing in the next couple of years for a, for a doctoral degree. Awesome. So a uh, question related to the the project that you're working on right now, is that an, in, in your conception, is that an open-ended project in terms of the number of movements you'd like to add to it? Or do you have um, kind of a specific vision mapped out with that? Yeah, I think it's, I really want it to be kind of like an alter ego to my um, concert composer world. So yeah. I have really dear friends of mine, um, two of them who come to my, well, one of them in particular, um, Gabrielle Herbst is an excellent composer based in, in the New York, Massachusetts, New Haven area, depending on where she's at for the pandemic. And um, she has a side project, solo project that she calls Gabi, and it's her singer songwriter project. And it's just this gorgeous music, um, totally not, well, not totally different sound world, but you can tell that the two borrow from each other. And that was something, and, and I have a, a handful of other friends who have started doing that for themselves. And so it almost feels like I can give myself um, a reason to want to play music that might soothe me in that moment, but mm -hmm. might not be what I want to give to others. And so this music is music that I plan to have for myself. It's not really music that I care to have others play, um, mm -hmm. but I will reserve that for the pieces that I choose to share with others. So I think that this is just my own way of getting out some of the ideas in my head. But actually, um, I'm going to pull up a little thing here. Uh, when I was thinking about what I want the project to be, it's really thinking about um, sort of everyday objects or activities or events or, you know, things like um, when I was uh, driving across the country this past year, and I was going back home to Colorado. And as I was driving further east, I just was paying attention to how much space there is and the expanse and the fact that, you know, when you drive through Nebraska, for example, the um, farm equipment machines that are in the fields are larger than blocks of houses here in New Haven or in New York City. And, you know, that's such a beautiful thing to explore, but also um, can also 
kind of play into the luxuries that I think about when I, um, you know, had a backyard as a kid growing up and can go and play in the backyard. And then I see my friends out here who have children and, um, you know, they take them to the park, which is great, but man, I loved my backyard. And, and I think that that's a real luxury that I never really thought about till now. So I think for me, it's, it's all about exploring the bigger pictures within our lives and through these smaller items that we might not consider as something that was really valuable or, or beyond, you know, a real thought. So, yeah. Well, I look forward to whatever you add on to that. Cause uh, Thank you. again, like with smoke screen, uh, very musical, poetic, but also very direct in your text. And um, it's just, it's appreciated hearing a valuable, honest voice coming through. So I'm excited to see what comes with that in the future. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Louis, do you see, I think there's a chat that came in on Zoom. Yeah. This is from Angela Smith, who's watching on the Zoom. Angela says, I celebrate all women in music, particularly women composers. How do you think you can be a role model for other women? Yeah, that's an excellent question that I'm thinking about all the time, um, particularly given our current state of political issues. And, um, you know, for me personally, in this past week, I think that I've shed many tears over the loss of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I've also shared, uh, shed many tears over the injustices for Breonna Taylor in the past 24 hours in particular. And these are women who have impacted our society in, you know, in ways that have made us really think. And um, I hope that, you know, one of my goals as being a woman composer, or educator or performer is that people are able to look beyond that and say, wow, she's just a really great composer or a really good performer or whatever the case may be. At the same time, I remember when I was teaching, um, well, I was teaching middle and high school band in uh, a very rural part of Illinois. And, you know, there were students who had never seen a female band director in front of them. And um, there were points where I had to consider what it meant for me to be that role model for the students. And I hope that anytime that I'm working with my students or anytime that I'm working with anybody that they see that there is a future for them, um, that there is a hope for them, and that I am available for any sort of um, conversations that they want to have for that, particularly just being a listening board for them and saying, I have, I understand, I've been there too. I've had somebody, um, you know, question why I'm uh, a female band director or I was, you know, the only woman in the percussion studio at NIU for a semester or I was, um, you know, I, I, this, this last year was the first year that there was actually... Um, there were more women composers in the Yale uh, composition studio than there were men. It was seven women and, and six men, which is the first time that it had ever, ever happened. So again, these are things that I'm constantly thinking about. And actually the piece that I wrote, the, the premiere piece for the Concord of Discord was about that. Um, it's called Today I Dress Myself in Symbols. And it was talking about all of the things that I wear every day, um, the rings that I have, the uh, clothes that I choose to wear, how I how I dress myself and, and embody these really strong women in my life that have influenced me. And hope that, again, um, whether it is directly stating it or just through an unconscious um, state of being that the women around me will recognize that and say, you know, we can, we can come together. And for me, it's really all about building a community. Um, I, I don't ever want to be in a position where I feel like I'm contributing to any sort of divisiveness. And I think more than ever right now, we all need that sort of um, coming together. And so if there are, you know, women in the world who are showing that they can do that and bring people together, then that's, that's where you'll find me. Yeah, I, every time you answer one of these questions or just like every time I talk to you, I feel like I learn something or gain some insight. Um, it's just really nice to hear you speak. I don't have any response or anything to add on beyond that. Just like. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that. And it's been, you know, just a, a backstory for, um, Anybody who's watching, Lewis and I have been good friends for a couple of years, but 
um, you know, we've, we've kind of passed, uh, pieces back and forth between each other or like videos back and forth of, um, materials that we're working on or that we're sharing with others. And, um, you know, I'm just very grateful for, for his friendship and for having him as a colleague, um, particularly in the percussion world. So just a shout out to you, Lewis, for all the work that you're doing. Thanks. Um, CJ, any other questions or anything we can do to wrap up? I, uh, I don't see any other, uh, questions or comments in the chat. Thank you for the, those of you that um, contributed the questions tonight. It's really valuable. Um, I do have one other question that I, I prepped Alexis on about, and I promised I would do this at the end because I wanted to make sure that we're giving proper professional credit for the amazing things that Alexis is doing. Um, if you go, and definitely please like keep up with both Lewis and Alexis um, through websites and social media because they're doing wonderful things all the time. Like please follow them and support them and keep elevating these um, amazing young talents. Like we need to continue to get this out in the world in whatever way we can. Uh, but if, if you just take a gander at the bio of Alexis Lamb and go to, I think it's the last paragraph, something that really caught my attention because I can relate is um, apparently Alexis um, has an overly competitive streak when it comes to board games. And uh, I celebrate that. And I'd just like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. So in preparation for that, I actually <laughs> ran upstairs and took a photo of what our entertainment center looks like with yes. all our board games. <laughs> okay. So this is this is not a comprehensive photo of all of the board games that are in our house. Um, but what I will say is that there are certain games on this entertainment center or ones like Monopoly in particular, which is not here, but it's it's present in the in the apartment where um, I will not speak to my wife for a couple of days after. So <laughs> it depends on the day. It depends on the conversation. We've been playing a lot of collaborative games. So pandemic has been one, not only because of the you know situation that we're in, um, the, it's, it's sheer irony, but it's also just a really good board game. And it's where everybody wins or everybody loses. So it's, again, um, there have been less fights about that, which while we're in quarantine is probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Alexis and CJ, can I get both of y'all's like most competitive board game? I, I think for me and my siblings, it's definitely Scrabble. Like we will, we'll go all out. It's like playing chess. How long will take to take turns? Yeah. Uh, well, as a child, I was pretty ruthless with Monopoly. I'm not sure if my sister tuned in tonight, but I apologize, Beth Ann. If if you're watching, I apologize. Um, and then my wife just talks about how we, we play a lot of Farkle these days, which is a dice game. Um, we have Loon Farkles, uh, again, thanks to my sister. She lives in Minnesota, so we have the Loon in place of the One. And we play a lot of uh, Five Crowns. And um, the characteristic that my wife points out is uh, when it's on, it's on. And if I feel like I've lost a little too much, then I'll turn it on. Um, I can't help myself. I'm sorry. Yeah. Alexis. Five Crowns is on my is on my list of games. My brother's friend introduced me to that this summer, and I'm just all about it. Um, yeah, I would say Monopoly with my is is like one of my fiercest. Um, I get really competitive at cribbage, though. That was a a family <laughs> game that we got really competitive at. Same. And then um, Catan is always kind of a dangerous game for us here in the family. So um, we play it when we have room to go somewhere else afterwards <laughs> which is not right now we haven't played it in a long time <laughs> it's, it's packed up for the time being it is yeah it hasn't been played since like last year i'm pretty sure but it'll make a return it will yes yeah wonderful well i appreciate you humoring me on that um anything else lewis um no thank you alexis for the incredible music and yes um, thank you for the premiere of smokescreen that was that yeah, you know, was amazing um, for people watching, Alexis made that, created like created the piece, created the video just for this concert. Um, and so really glad that we were the ones who got to share that. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to write another piece for Concord. I'm super excited about that. So, and again, thank you so much for having me on for this evening and um, allowing me to be a part of the, the Inside Out Steel Band community. Yeah, you're in the family. 
Yeah. <laughs> we, we did get one other question that came in uh, sure. on YouTube from Olivia Bolt. Uh, will the music for Smokescreen be available for purchase anytime soon? Oh, hi, Olivia. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, this is going to be one of the pieces actually that I'm saving for, for myself to play. Um, I'm hoping to have other pieces similar to it that'll be, you know, within the speaking and percussion realms in the future. Um, but I think that this is going to be for, for the solo project alone. Yeah. But I hope to do more, you know, when things start opening up, um, the goal for me is to get enough of this repertoire together so that I can put all these instruments in my car and um, travel around and play in particularly in places that are non-traditional concert hall spaces, hoping to play in, you know, just outdoor gardens or yards or um, libraries or places that it can be really accessible to a, a number of people who might feel like the concert hall space isn't um, always welcome to them. So that's the goal. We'll see. Wonderful. Thanks for the question, Olivia. Yeah. Um, yeah again, congrats uh, to both of you. Thank you for your contributions. Um, and I don't know if I gave a shout out to all the performers on the video from Nebraska Lincoln. And of course, our great friend, Lauren Malloy, who contributed the tenor pan part. We love you, Lauren. Thanks for contributing that. Um, and thank you to all of you for tuning in once again. Uh, just keep up with us on our website. You can subscribe to our newsletter for upcoming performances. Uh, we will have another composer spotlight. Probably Lewis and I just spoke about this probably four to six weeks from now. So just keep your eye on that. And we'll have other Inside Out Community Steel Band content coming up as well. Um, and once again, as always, uh, you are welcome to join us in the Community Steel Band from wherever you are. One advantage to being online right now is our Tuesday night community steel band classes are accessible to everybody um, across the country. We even have someone outside of the country that's joining us right now, so you can find that information online. Um, so we appreciate all of you. Please stay safe and be kind to one another, and we look forward to seeing you again the next time. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Take care.